This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944 8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. VSH.org. Very happy to have with us tonight Mr. Gene Bouston. Eighteen years ago, he and his wife Laurie established the first farm animal shelter in America. Today, with shelters in New York and California and plans for additional shelters, Farm Sanctuary is the premier shelter in America. Jean and Laurie Bouston have waged campaigns to stop farm animal cruelty, including their No Downers, No Veal, and Farm Animal Defense campaigns, and their efforts have resulted in precedent-setting cruelty convictions of stockyards, factory farms, and slaughterhouses. Farm Sanctuary's groundbreaking investigative campaigns have been featured on CNN, CBS, and National Public Radio, as well as in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Los Angeles Times, and news stories around the country. Mr. Boston has a master's degree in agricultural economics from Cornell University. He's a dedicated animal advocate and a longtime vegan. Please welcome Gene Boston. Here we are. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It is great to be here. Last time I was in Hawaii, I was about 14 years old and came with the family and we were bopping from one spot to the next spot to the next spot. And unfortunately, on this trip, I'm also bopping from one spot to the next spot to the next spot. I'm going to have to come back here with, with Lori and spend a little bit of time on the beach and enjoy a little bit of the beautiful air, water, and people. This is, I've really enjoyed myself here and wish I could be staying longer. Unfortunately, I'm heading out early tomorrow morning. But I'm here to talk about factory farming and our experiences visiting these facilities. When we started Farm Sanctuary in 1986, there was very little information available about what happens on factory farms, exactly how are animals raised who are being used for meat, milk, and eggs. So we wanted to get first-hand experience with that industry, and the best way we knew how was to visit farms. Um, so we started going to facilities where animals are raised, and we saw some pretty horrendous things. I remember one of our first visits, we went to a stockyard in Pennsylvania. It's called Lancaster Stockyards. It's one of the largest stockyards in the eastern part of the United States. And we were walking around the back of the facility and came across the dead pile. This is where the animals who die during the marketing process are just discarded. And as we come up, up upon this pile, we saw dead cows, dead pigs, dead sheep. It was a hot, humid August day, and the maggots were literally buzzing. They were about an inch thick, and they were literally buzzing as we approached this pile. As we got closer, one of the sheep on the pile lifted her head. We thought she would have to be euthanized. You know, we were obviously not going to leave her there. But, so we took her off the dead pile, put her in our van, went to the local veterinarian, thinking again she'd have to be euthanized. The vet started poking around, and within about 15 or 20 minutes, she perked up and she stood up. And she stood up for the rest of the trip from Lancaster Stockyards back to our base, which at the time was a little row house in Wilmington, Delaware. And she stood for 12 years. She lived with us for that long before dying in her sleep at our sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York, where she's now buried. The fact that a living animal could be thrown away on a pile of dead animals was shocking to us. And we felt it must be illegal. This cannot be acceptable according to the law. So we tried to get cruelty charges filed against Lancaster Stockyard back in 1986. 
We went to the local Humane Society, we went to the local prosecutors, and they told us that there was nothing that could be done, that this was considered a normal agricultural operation, and that normal agricultural operations are not illegal. Most states in the United States have an exemption for normal agricultural operations. And what is a normal agricultural operation? It is a practice adopted year after year in the production of livestock by the livestock industry. So if agribusiness starts doing something, such as throwing live animals on piles of dead animals, or such as throwing living animals in trash cans, if it is a normal practice, if it is something that is commonly done, it is considered legal in most states. More recently, we had a similar case in New Jersey. There are some interesting things happening there that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. But we, I was doing an investigation of an egg factory. And this particular facility has about a million birds in battery cages, small wire enclosures where they can't even stretch their wings, and they live there for over a year at a time. I was walking around the facility videotaping the conditions because our intention was to make an issue of the cruelty to these hens and to say that this should be illegal. As I was about to leave, there was, I saw a trash can and a couple of live birds in the trash can were moving. So I took them out of the trash can, took them to a vet who treated them and they both lived for a little while. They lived for about two weeks before they died. They weren't in great shape, obviously. But we tried to get charges filed against this egg factory. It's called Issei. The local law enforcement people wouldn't do anything about it. And so ultimately, we hired a couple of lawyers who the prosecutor in this county, Warren County, New Jersey, gave permission to represent the state of New Jersey. So a couple of our lawyers are now representing the state of New Jersey. And I personally had to file the charges and, and fill out the paperwork as the plaintiff or whatever, I don't know what I'd be called exactly, the complainant. And we got that case in court. As the case moved forward, Issei had their attorney and they argued in court that they could legally treat the birds like manure. The judge said, isn't there a big difference between live birds and manure? And Issei's attorney responded by saying, no, your honor. They were convicted at the first level, but they appealed the case and it was overturned, so they were ultimately found not guilty in that particular case. You know, with our work, we do the investigations, we do education, and we're now trying to do legislation or litigation to stop the cruelty. Returning back to Lancaster Stockyards, after we were unable to get charges filed when Hilda, the sheep, was found on the dead pile, we continued visiting and documenting conditions of downed animals and, and animals just left for dead. We were taking pictures and we had a demonstration there in 1988 to draw attention, started raising awareness in the community. And then in 1991, Farm Sanctuary incorporated as a law enforcement agency in the state of Pennsylvania. And we continued with our documentation. In one instance, there was a down cow that was just left to die at the stockyard. We filed charges against Lancaster Stockyards and they were found guilty of cruelty to animals in 1993. That was the first time ever that a stockyard in the U.S. was found guilty of cruelty to animals for a practice that up until that time had been considered a normal agricultural practice. But what happened between 1986 and 1993 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania is that the community and people, people started seeing pictures of cruelty at Lancaster Stockyards. People started seeing pictures of animals left on piles of dead animals. They started recognizing that there was an issue here, there was a concern here. And most citizens don't approve of that kind of cruelty, that kind of wanton disregard for sentient beings, for living creatures. So there was an education process that happened in, in Lancaster County, and as a result of it, and as a result of our uh, incorporating as an SPCA to enforce the laws ourselves, we were able to get them convicted. What happened the following year was the Farm Bureau, a strong agribusiness voice, introduced legislation in Harrisburg, the state capital in Pennsylvania, to prevent law enforcement agents, humane enforcement agents, from prosecuting farmers 
So now we had to get busy up in Harrisburg. And then we got into the legislative side of things. And we spent a lot of time lobbying in Harrisburg to prevent this bill that the Farm Bureau had put forward from passing. And we were able to stop it and to come up with a compromise that everybody could live with in that case. Basically, humane agents can still enforce laws with regard to farm animals. They just need to be trained. So that was a reasonable compromise. Right now, what agribusiness is doing is they are proposing laws in various states to outlaw taking pictures of animals in these factory farms. And the reason is that these pictures are not pretty. The inhumane treatment of these animals at these facilities is unacceptable to most citizens and also because change is in the air. As I mentioned, most state anti-cruelty laws exempt farm animals. Up until November of 2002, Nothing was illegal, basically. Farmers could do anything they wanted. But in November 2002, Florida voters voted to ban a cruel farming system. They voted to outlaw the use of gestation crates. These are two-foot-wide metal enclosures where breeding pigs are kept for years, for most of their lives, unable even to turn around. And we have a videotape that will show a little bit more about that, so I don't want to go into too much more detail. But I want to talk about the process and the reason we had to go to the initiative in Florida. We had a bill introduced in Tallahassee, the state capital of Florida, to outlaw gestation crates and to say that these pigs need at least enough space to turn around. That bill was introduced and it was referred to the Agriculture Committee. The Agriculture Committee is made up of legislators who represent agricultural interests. And those folks are not terribly sympathetic to animal protection issues. So in Florida, this bill didn't even get a hearing in the Agriculture Committee. It died. That's why we had to go to the people. There are 24 states in the U.S. that allow you to pursue an initiative. This is where if the legislature, the assembly members and senators or representatives and senators or whatever they're called in, in the various states, if they don't take action, there are 24 states that allow citizens to take action. And it's not an easy process. In, in Florida, we had to collect over 600,000 signatures of registered voters. Took a lot of energy to get that many signatures in order to get this measure on the ballot. So we got a measure on the ballot saying that pigs had to have at least enough space to turn around, thereby prohibiting the use of these two-foot-wide metal gestation crates. On, in November 2002, over 2.6 million Florida voters voted yes on Amendment 10 and banned gestation crates. That was the first time ever that a factory farming device was prohibited in the United States. And it proved that citizens do not accept that kind of inhumane treatment of animals, even farm animals. Right now in the state of New Jersey, there's legislation that addresses how veal calves are raised. I mean, how many of you in this room have heard about how veal calves are raised? Veal calves are the unwanted byproducts of the dairy industry. For a cow to give milk, she has to have a calf. Half of the calves born are female, and those females are raised to become milking cows. The other half of the cows born are males, and they are of no use to the dairy industry. They don't produce milk, obviously. So the veal industry was created to take advantage of these unwanted male calves, and veal calves are taken from their mothers right at birth, chained by the neck in crates that are just two feet wide, and that's how they live their whole lives. They're usually slaughtered at about five or six months old. They're also fed a diet that is deficient in iron and fiber in order to produce a pale colored meat that is sold as veal. So that's what veal is. The use of the crate and this anemic diet has been outlawed in Europe for many years. It's still legal in every state in the U.S. right now. But in the state of New Jersey, there is a bill that has now passed the state Senate it has passed an assembly committee, and it is now on the assembly floor. If that passes, it will be the first law in the U.S. to go through the legislative process to ban a cruel factory farming practice. Again, demonstrating that these are issues of growing concern to people, you know, as in Florida, and also to legislators. So change is in the air. We have a video here that I, I'd like to show now. It, it talks about three cruel farming practices, veal crates, battery cages, and gestation crates, and shows some, some images of them. It also talks about how these animals would live in a more natural environment.
From the first bedtime stories we hear as children to our last dinner out, most Americans imagine scenes like these when they think of farms. Rolling pastures, clean barns, healthy and contented creatures. This is Farm Sanctuary, and in many ways it is the fairy tale. These rescued animals have escaped the real story. They are the few lucky survivors of today's factory farming system. The unbridled quest for economic efficiency has led here, to filthy, overcrowded, industrialized farms that threaten our health, pollute our environment, and subject billions of animals to intolerable cruelty. Each is a sentient being, endowed with awareness and feeling. To agribusiness, they are mere commodities, raw materials on an assembly line. Their suffering is immense, unrelenting, and largely hidden. Fifteen years ago, a young couple set out to make a difference, and Farm Sanctuary was born. Lori and Jean Bauston shared an abiding concern for animals and dedicated themselves to unmasking the cruelty of factory farming. They ran their fledgling operation from a donated Wilmington, Delaware row house. To raise funds, the couple sold vegetarian hot dogs out of their VW van at events like Grateful Dead concerts. From the start, Lori and Jean sought first-hand information and made regular visits to farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. They documented conditions, such as the dead pile behind Lancaster Stockyards in Pennsylvania. There, amid the corpses, a young sheep raised her head as they approached. The Baustons took her home and named her Hilda. With care, she thrived, and so began the rescue of more and more abused animals. They soon expanded to several acres on a tofu farm in Avondale, Pennsylvania, where Hilda and her companions could graze. The Baustons lived there in an old school bus. By 1990, the four-year-old organization outgrew its home. Through hard work and generous contributions, Farm Sanctuary acquired 175 acres near Watkins Glen in New York's beautiful Finger Lakes region. In 1993, still growing, they established a presence in the nation's largest agricultural state, California. Orland, in the north, is now the site of a 300-acre refuge. Farm Sanctuary welcomes thousands of visitors every year. Both locations operate guided tours of their pristine fields, shelters, and the happy inhabitants. In people barns, everyone can learn the facts about animal factories and get tips for cruelty-free living. Watkins Glen even offers rustic B&B cabins, where guests awake to the sights and sounds of a uniquely peaceful farm. The animals at Farm Sanctuary are eloquent ambassadors for their species. Maimed beaks, crippled bodies and haunting eyes speak without words. They tell of battery cages where chickens cannot stretch their wings, of gestation crates where pigs live behind bars, and of veal crates where calves are tethered and anemic for life. Agribusiness wields massive political influence. They use slick public relation campaigns to obscure the reality of how animal products end up on our tables. Factory farming goliaths depend on the public to think of their products as wholesome, despite rampant disease and the widespread use of antibiotics. Once revealed, the inhumane methods used to produce meat, milk, and eggs are repugnant to the vast majority of consumers. Farm Sanctuary, now with over 100,000 dedicated members, wages its fight on a multitude of fronts. A major problem which we've been able to document has been the abuse of downed animals. 
a crippled cow, unable to walk, dragged at a stockyard in South St. Paul, Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing. They're called downers. These shocking pictures were taken at stockyards of... Downed animals are animals who are too thick or injured even to walk. When they can't be dragged by chains, the forklifts are brought in. The simplest solution to this problem is to ban the sale of downed animals at stockyards. We are making progress. In 1993, after seven years of campaigning, Lancaster Stockyards, where Hilda had been left out for dead, became the first U.S. stockyard to be convicted for abusing a downed animal. In 1995, in California, Farm Sanctuary helped enact the nation's first law which bans the marketing of downed animals at stockyards and slaughterhouses. Convictions soon followed. The owner pled guilty to violating a state law against... The No Downers campaign is gaining momentum. In 2000, the USDA agreed not to buy meat from downed animals for federal use, including the National School Lunch Program. Farm Sanctuary continues the vital work of documenting conditions. Our harrowing undercover photographs and videotapes have been aired nationally and internationally, reaching millions. Stockyards and slaughterhouses have become increasingly touchy about our visits. Hey, you take a spot out of something good to sleep? We got a camera in here? Get the hell out of here. Give me the okay. camera right now to film. Hey, hey! What are you guys doing here? I don't have that camera. You're pushing your luck. Where are you from, dude? Uh, I'm not fighting right in that goddamn mud. Listen, I'll come here with this camera. Hey, tell you what, boy, I, you guys are going to make me some mad. Agribusiness has the power and money, but they are not beyond the reach of America's conscience. In Florida, we are playing a key role in the first initiative in the United States to ban one of factory farming's most brutal devices, gestation crates. Breeding pigs are confined in two-foot-wide metal cages, pregnancy after pregnancy, day after day, year after year. For the first time in history, voters will decide a factory farming issue. The measure will be on the statewide ballot in November 2002. Farm Sanctuary continues to campaign against veal. Some of the country's most prestigious restaurants are among the hundreds who've signed our pledge not to sell veal from calves immobilized in crates. European nations have already outlawed such treatment. It is time to join them. We are reaching out to lawmakers, business, and consumers. And to reach young minds and hearts, we sponsor Cultivating Compassion a program that gently introduces school children to factory farming issues. Future generations are learning the importance of kindness and respect for all living creatures. Now, Hollywood legend Mary Tyler Moore has teamed up with Farm Sanctuary to chair our Sentient Beings campaign. Our goal is to raise awareness and elevate the social and legal status of farm animals in the United States. Like all animals, farm animals feel pain and they deserve to be protected from cruelty. We could not have a better spokesperson. We encourage people to consider vegetarian and vegan food choices. Since 1986, Farm Sanctuary's annual Adopt-a-Turkey program has offered Americans the chance to rethink the traditional Thanksgiving feast and to save a turkey instead of serving one. There are alternatives to the national meal, if you want to include a special guest. Hello, Farm Sanctuary. Yeah, this is the Adopt Turkey Line. How can I help you? A kind of Save the Turkey Federation has taken wing in New York and, of course, California, where Jean and Lori Bauston offer sanctuary to all rejected farm animals. Orphan turkeys are the featured critters this time of year. Not everyone is going to be eating turkey this Thanksgiving. Lori Bauston thinks you should adopt. She joins us from her farm. It's sanctuary. been a popular feature on network television for the past decade. And we'd like to see more options when we dine out. At the urging of Farm Sanctuary in the early 90s, most restaurants in Watkins Glen agreed to include vegetarian fare on their menus. Even the local Burger King came on board. Their veggie burger sold beyond the company's wildest expectations and led to a nationwide launch of the BK Veggie. Some animals are making their own publicity. Queenie the cow has a lot to say about her survivor story. 
Queenie said, move over. She escaped from a slaughterhouse in New York City. New York City animal control officers were flooded with calls to spare the calf's life. She was shaking and fearful. We load her up into the truck and we're trying to comfort her and tell her she's going to a wonderful place. We got to the sanctuary. I'll never forget this. She stepped off the trailer and let out a big moo. All of the other sanctuary cows, there were about 60 of them, gathered round to the closest fence and started mooing back. And then she started mooing, and then they started mooing, and there was this whole incredible loving exchange. So the cows are mooing, and we're crying, and, and it was just such an incredible, wonderful feeling. She really felt at home, and the other cattle really made her feel at home. And I just, again, saw, you know, they're no different than us. Clearly, the protection of helpless animals and an end to the pollution of our food, our ecology, and of our spirits is now on the American agenda. We have accomplished much in our first 15 years, but even as we celebrate this important anniversary, we continue to look ahead. To everyone here at our sanctuaries and around this vast nation, thank you for joining us. Generosity, compassion, vision, and vigilance has brought us this far. We are a growing movement with big plans. Increasing public support and an appreciative, enthusiastic family. So much remains to be done. But once you start thinking outside the crate, there is no end to what can be accomplished. When we have attempted to get this sort of footage on network television, they have been very reluctant to show it. Unfortunately, the media you know, gets a lot of money from McDonald's and other businesses that sell a lot of meat. We are faced with the difficulty of not being able to outspend them, and there's no way we can spend the hundreds of millions of dollars a year that the meat, dairy, and egg industries spend on advertising. So. The networks don't want to upset their good customers, essentially. We were going to run an ad in TV Guide a year ago about our annual Adopt a Turkey program, where we encourage people to adopt a turkey instead of eating one for Thanksgiving. And we had the page set up, and we were going to run this full-page ad. But unfortunately, Butterball, the turkey bit company, was going to run an ad in the same issue of TV Guide, and Butterball gives them a lot more money than we give them, and so they refuse to run our ad. So even when we're willing to pay to run information about these things, we're sometimes prohibited and prevented from doing it. So I encourage anybody here who has the opportunity to show this video to others to do so. We have a couple over there on the table, but we, they're also available from Farm Sanctuary, and we have our website, you can get them from that. We, we're encouraging libraries to stock these. We think people need to see what is happening on these factory farms. When people know how these animals are raised, they don't accept it. We saw that in Florida. We're seeing that now in New Jersey. All the polling that we have done shows that people are appalled by the cruelty that exists on factory farms. What has happened over the past couple of decades is that agribusiness has utilized antibiotics, and various technologies and hormones and so on to maximize production. The bottom line is to make as much money as possible while spending as little as possible. And in doing that, the husbandry practices that have been known for years in terms of taking care of farm animals have been lost. And certain practices that are absolutely irresponsible are coming into to regular use. The chickens that are being discarded, to, in order for egg production to occur, you know, you have two types of chickens. You have your meat type chickens and you have your egg type chickens. Meat birds have been genetically bred to grow very fast and very large. And many of them die of heart attacks at just a couple of weeks old because they're growing so fast. But because they are growing so fast, you can afford to lose 
nationwide, millions every year. Millions die of heart attacks every year, but because they're growing so fast, it's still profitable to do that. So that's your meat chickens. Different than them are the egg-laying chickens. It's a whole different strain, a whole different breed of bird. They don't grow very fast and they don't grow very large. So at the hatchery that is hatching out egg-laying hens, you have female chicks and male chicks. The females are used for egg production. The males are useless. So they are literally discarded the day they're hatched. We've seen dumpsters full of them being thrown away at hatcheries. I was at a hatchery one time and saw unwanted male chicks being thrown on an auger, which is like a big screw. I don't know if any of you have ever seen an auger. It's usually used to move grain or other material, cement, things like that. And there were some of these unwanted chicks on this auger, which was turning and moving them. And they were being slowly dismembered on the way up. At the end, they were being dumped into a manure spreader to be spread on the field like manure. Again, it just shows sort of the, how far it has gone away from basic human decency. So in the egg industry, you have these unwanted male chicks that are dumped at the hatchery. You also have the, uh, the spent hens. After the hens have been in these battery cages for a year or two, there's two things that might happen. They may be force molted, which means they are starved for about two weeks to 18 days to shock their system into another egg laying cycle to keep them in production longer. That's force molting and that is done to, to actually most laying hens. Or they are slaughtered. And when they're slaughtered, the slaughterhouses don't want them. You have all of these meat birds being raised, these fat meat birds. The egg laying hens are skinny, they're beat up, they've been in these cages for a year, they have bruised bodies. Slaughterhouses would much rather slaughter the meat birds. And as the meat, industry, meat bird industry has boomed, the slaughterhouses are operating at 24 hours a day. They don't want to spend any time killing these less valuable, scrawny spent hens. So the spent hens now are just being thrown in landfills, in some cases, they're being ground up and turned back into animal feed. There's one guy who developed a machine. So when, when an egg farm is ready to depopulate and get rid of their spent hens, this machine grinds them up alive at the egg farm and turns them into chicken feed. So this, again, speaks to the agribusiness mentality that you, these animals are not animals. They are just material. They are just product. They are just property. And in the case of spent hens, if you have to take them to a landfill and dispose of them that way, they're a liability. So now you have to actually spend money to get rid of this waste product. If you can grind them up and turn them into feed, now you've turned a waste product into an asset, into a feed source. And agribusiness does that. The mad cow disease problem that we have started witnessing now in North America, but which has been in Europe for a long time, started when dead animals, dead cows, were being fed to live cows. And it was part of the same attitude of agribusiness taking this waste product, these dead bodies that have to be buried or otherwise disposed of, and turning them into an asset. By grinding them up, they were feeding them back to cows, but doing so, they were also now spreading disease. Agribusiness also feeds chicken manure to cows. Same thing. There's this unwanted waste product. What are we going to do with it? Hey, if we can feed cows, we've now gotten rid of the waste and we've turned it into an asset. But there are consequences. It is possible that the way the regulations are now in the U.S., cows ground up are fed to chickens. Chicken manure is then fed to cows again. So it's possible that cows are going through chickens and coming back to cows and bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is a scientific name for mad cow disease, could be being cycled now from cows through chickens and back to cows. Recently, mad cow disease was discovered in Canada. And that is very significant because there's a lot of trade between the U.S. and Canada, and there's a lot of cows that go back and forth between the U.S. and Canada, and in fact, there are now some animals in Montana that have been identified as connected somehow with a cow in Canada who had mad cow disease. The cow discovered to have mad cow disease was a down cow, meaning that this is an animal too sick even to walk. She was not slaughtered for human food, but in fact, ended up in pet food. I believe that the 
practices in Canada are actually more strict, more stringent than in the United States. I believe that if that cow was at a U.S. slaughterhouse, she probably would have ended up in the U.S. food supply. In the U.S., it is common and practice, and it is absolutely legal for downed animals, again, animals too sick even to walk, to be slaughtered and used for human food. We've attempted to stop this in Washington, D.C. We have a petition before the FDA. We are suing the USDA, and we're working to advance the Downed Animal Protection Act, a, a, a new legislative proposal to prevent the marketing and slaughter of downed animals. The USDA, when we went to them with this issue, responded in writing by saying that it is legal to use diseased animals for human food. The FDA has yet to respond formally. The U.S. Congress, who we've been lobbying since 1992 to pass the Downed Animal Protection Act, has generally been unsympathetic, largely because these bills, like bills at the state level, go to the Agriculture Committee, the Agriculture Committee made up of legislators friendly to agribusiness interests. So we've never been able to get the Downed Animal Protection Act out of the Agriculture Committee until last year during discussions of the Farm Bill. We were able to attach the downed animal language on the floor of the House. Gary Ackerman is the author of the Downed Animal Protection Act. He's from New York. The discussion of the Farm Bill on the floor of the House of Representatives was being managed by the Chairman of the Agriculture Committee, Larry Combest from Texas, and the ranking Democrat on the Agriculture Committee, Charles Stenholm, also from Texas. So you have these two Texans managing the floor debate. This guy from New York, legislator from New York, says, I've got a proposal. I want to offer it as an amendment to the Farm Bill on the floor. Stenholm and Combest say to him, okay, we'll get to you. Hold, hold on, we'll, we'll be right with you. And they go on and tell him that if you propose this amendment, it is going down. People will not support it, and it's going to go down on a voice vote. And a voice vote is basically where the people managing the discussion say ayes, and certain people say aye, nays, nays, certain people say nay. And then the person managing the discussion interprets it and says the nays have it. No matter how many people say aye or nay, a voice vote basically means that whoever's calling the shots says an aye or a nay. So Stenholm and Combat said, it's going down on a voice vote. To which Gary Ackerman said, well, then I'm going to call for a recorded vote. A recorded vote meaning that all the legislators there are going to have to vote yes or no, and their vote will be recorded. And during the course of the day, and Ackerman went down around noon. He was not allowed to bring this forward for a vote until about 11 o'clock at night. He was there for over 10 hours waiting to present this, and they wouldn't let him, and that was part of their way of stonewalling him. But when he finally presented it around 11 o'clock at night, there were five or six other members of Congress who stood up in support of this amendment, saying, we think that the way these animals are treated is absolutely unacceptable, and we're in full support of this amendment. Seeing how the discussion was going, Stenholm and Combest then agreed and said, well, you know, we think this is a good idea and we'll support it. After all day long saying, playing a poker game with Ackerman, saying, oh, this isn't going anywhere, it's going to lose, but seeing how it went, they went for it and supported it. A couple months later, or actually about a month later, now this legislation goes to the conference committee. The conference committee is made up of senior members of the Agriculture Committee in the House and the Senate, because a measure similar to this had passed the Senate. In the conference committee, there is no open discussion. It is a secretive meeting. And in that conference committee, Stenholm and Combest and other agriculture committee members gutted the downed animal provision, saying that they replaced it with a study. So after this public statement of support and after this recorded vote pushing them to say, okay, we'll let this go, they went ahead and killed it later on when nobody was looking in the conference committee. So that's what happened last year during the discussion of the Farm Bill with the Down Animal Protection Act. And we're bringing it back again in this 108th Congress. It should be introduced within the next week or two. And it has more original co-sponsors than ever before. And we're pushing it and we're hoping that it will move forward. But that gives you a sense of... the kind of political stuff you deal with. We have not 
been able really to get inside of these meetings, but we're slowly beginning to, and we're beginning to have more and more friends and allies in the legislature. In fact, when the bill passed the floor of the House, again, this is like 11 o'clock or midnight when it finally passed, and I was stunned. I was in Washington watching it on like a, a TV screen somewhere, and Gary Ackerman was on the floor, obviously. So when this happened, I ran right over to his office, and he came out, you know, just real happy doing the high 10 thing and said, man, I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. You know, he's been sitting on the floor waiting to produce, propose this and he's not eating all day. And he says, you're a vegetarian, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I got tofu, so let's eat tofu. So that was, we had a little tofu celebration with the passage of that through the house. But unfortunately, it was later gutted in the conference committee. And again, we're, we're bringing that back. But these downed... Again, agribusiness's idea is to use these downed animals for human food. Again, if people knew they were being fed animals too sick even to walk, they would not stand for it. But this is a common agribusiness practice. Uh, it is cruel to the animals, and it also puts people at risk. There is evidence that we might have a form of mad cow disease in the U.S., even before the Canadian discovery last year, or, or actually within the last few weeks. There was research done in 1993, that was published in 1993, where the, the, these mink in the upper Midwest in Wisconsin died of transmissible mink encephalopathy, which is a brain disease mink get. And researchers wondered, how did this happen? What caused this outbreak? And they concluded it's probably their feed. So they looked at what these mink were eating, and they were being fed down cows, cows too sick to walk. So Richard Marsh from the University of Wisconsin did research. He took material from these mink who had died and he inoculated healthy cattle. Those cattle became downed animals. And then he took remains of those cows and fed them back to mink and the mink, healthy mink, started showing signs of transmissible mink encephalopathy. His study was published and he concluded that these findings suggest the presence of an unrecognized BSE-like disease in the U.S. BSE being bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is mad cow disease. So in 93, he was stating that these findings suggest the presence of an unrecognized BSE-like disease in the U.S. He did not receive funding to continue his research. In the U.S., I don't believe we want to find mad cow disease. If we do, it's going to cost the beef industry a lot of money. So I don't believe we're looking very hard at all. In the U.S. last year, we tested about 20,000 cows for mad cow disease, and that's more than we've ever tested before. It was down less than 10,000 a year prior to that. In Europe, they test 20,000 cows every day. So that just gives you a sense of how little we have been looking and I believe we have a huge problem that's going to be happening in the not too distant future in the U.S. with mad cow disease. SARS is another thing that's in the news nowadays where we have, what's it called? S sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Severe, severe, okay. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Thanks, because I didn't know what it was. That has been linked to a province in China where there's lots and lots of animals. And it is now recognized that the source of that was from animals. When you have high concentrations of people and animals together, you have a greater likelihood of transmission of disease. And on these factory farms, you have hundreds of thousands of animals, or even in some cases, millions of animals, confined in very small areas where disease is rampant. So you have now these emerging pathogens, new things that were not problems years ago that are coming into being. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease, and the human counterpart now, CJD, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, is one example of that. This SARS, I believe, is another example of that. We have the antibiotic-resistant bacteria now that are developing because farm animals are routinely fed antibiotics. Most of the antibiotics produced in the U.S. are fed to farm animals and that is to make them grow faster. But a consequence of that is that bacteria that are resistant to these antibiotics are the ones that still stay alive. 
And they're the ones that then become predominant. And then they're the ones that are now not treatable by antibiotics. So when you have E. coli infections now, people cannot be treated, and people are starting now to die from these emerging pathogens. So these are some of the horrible things that are consequences of, of factory farming. Another horrible consequence is labor. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like to work in a factory farm or to work in one of these slaughterhouses where all you did day after day was cut the throats of animals? What a violent existence that would be. So that's another negative consequence of factory farming and, and a meat-based diet. So, so there are many bad things associated with it, but there are, I believe, positive signs because these practices are not acceptable to most people, but these practices have been performed out of sight and out of mind. And most people have not recognized their complicity and their contribution and their financial support of these practices by buying a steak or a piece of pork or a piece of chicken meat or an egg or whatever, we're financially subsidizing these kinds of practices. It might seem daunting to say, well, I'm not, to, to make the change and say, I'm not going to eat that stuff anymore. Thinking about it without having thought about it before can seem very difficult. But in fact, it's really pretty easy. There are lots and lots of substitutes now for cow's milk. There's lot, you know, soy milk's healthier. There's lots of substitutes for eggs. There's lots of meatless meat products you can eat. You can even just eat spaghetti without the meatballs. So there's a lot of easy things to do. With this issue, on the one hand, it seems so huge. There are nine billion farm animals raised and slaughtered every year in the US, so it does seem so huge. But it is also very touchable because each of us can choose whether or not to support these industries. Each of us, through our consumer choices that we make every day, can choose to buy foods that are produced in a more humane, sustainable way. And, and by buying foods that are produced in a more humane, sustainable way, we are helping animals, we are helping workers, we are helping the environment because these factory farms are horrible polluters, and we are helping ourselves. You know, since I became a vegan back in 1985, you know, my diet has actually gotten a lot more interesting. I've eaten a lot more ethnic foods. I eat a lot. I'm more creative when, I, when it comes to eating. And I've cooked a couple of things that are pretty cool once in a while. You know, I'm not generally a cook, and I'm usually pretty simple. I take like a, a handful of pasta, <laughs> throw it on the plate, a little margarine, nutritional yeast, and soy sauce, and I'm happy. You know, and I, so I'm not particularly a a great connoisseur, but there have been times when I've made some pretty fun stuff. I took tofu and mixed it with stuffing, you know, that people often put in turkeys. Just took this tofu and this stuffing, and it really worked good, because tofu by itself is a little heavy, a little stuffing made it kind of light and kind of nice. So these are things that I never would have experimented with had I not become a vegan. And so I just, for those of you who have never considered be not eating animal products, it's please don't be intimidated because it's really not that hard. I mean, there's even veggie hot dogs and veggie burgers you can get now. So it's, it's getting to be easier and easier. But I'd like to just mention a couple of our stories. And again, I think these speak to how agribusiness does not want people to see what is happening, how they do not want these images to be out there. I was at a veal farm in Wisconsin last November and I was taking pictures of the veal crates and showing just how these animals are treated and when I was in there the veal farmer showed up and he was pretty pretty angry and uh, he showed up in the door and so I was I had no escape he was seeming again his jaws twitching and he's I'm thinking and one of my first things to him was you should call the police which he did. So we waited there for about an hour for the police to come. Quite a tense hour. I was trying to speak to him saying, you know, your farm's not as bad as some of the other ones I've seen. And he just said things like, well, you shouldn't be here. And he was just really, really edgy. But when the cops came, the main thing he was concerned about is get his camera, get his film. I don't want people to see this stuff. And the police did make me destroy some of the videotape that, that I had taken at this guy's veal farm. But the fact that he, that this was such a concern for him, I think is very telling. We've been in other facilities where we've had to hightail it out of there. I was at a gestation crate farm in Florida 
you know, as we were working on this campaign to prohibit the use of gestation crates, this initiative effort, and we had to document what was going on. So I was in one of these gestation crate farms, and it was a huge facility. So I was on one side, and as this guy comes on the other side, he starts moving right towards me. So I had my running shoes on at the time. I slipped out the back, and away I went. And I was through the orange groves, and it was all okay, and I had the footage, and we got it on TV later on. We've asked permission to go to these places. We've asked folks to be able to see what's going on. But they are very concerned, for good reason, because what is going on at these places is repugnant to most people. What has started happening now in recent years is fences are starting to go up. Sometimes they have barbed wire on them. Guard stations are starting to go up at these facilities. And now laws are being introduced to prohibit the taking of pictures in these places. We had one of our workers in upstate New York who was called about a cruelty case at a local sheep farm. She went in, knocked on the door. The farmer wasn't around. The barn was right near the driveway, so she looked in the barn. See, she saw a lamb who was crippled. He was not able to use his back legs. He was dragging himself around. He was not able to see. His eyes were crusted shut. He was being trampled out by the other sheep in the barn. It was an emergency situation, so she jumped in, grabbed the lamb, brought him to farm sanctuary. We cleaned him up. And, you know, for about a, he was there for about a half hour to an hour. Then he went directly to Cornell University, the veterinary school there, to be treated because he was in very bad shape. He ended up being euthanized later that day. Susie, our shelter director who, who did this, was then charged with felony burglary for rescuing this lamb. We were able to get the charges dismissed after the DA received thousands of letters from people all over the country expressing outrage that this merciful act would be met with such a punitive, mean-spirited kind of response. But that is sort of the battle that we're now engaged in, where we are attempting to obtain footage and expose this sort of cruelty, and where agribusiness has a very strong interest in preventing this information from getting out, and they also want to prevent anybody from going in and, and documenting these conditions. I believe that there is enough information available that that most consumers, if they see a video like this, would agree that these practices are not acceptable. And I believe agribusiness really is vulnerable now because the practices they employ are not acceptable to most citizens who they depend on to buy their products. And that's why I believe we're now seeing companies like even McDonald's urging their suppliers to treat animals more humanely. Companies like Burger King are starting to do the same. And you know that McDonald's and Burger King did not start pushing for more humane treatment of animals without doing a lot of market research and getting a real good sense of what consumers want. So we're now at a time where where things are going to change. And in addition to stopping cruelty, we need, I think, to be promoting vegan and vegetarian foods. And this is where I take my hat off to Hawaii for passing that law a couple years ago, urging that vegetarian food be made available in the schools. That is wonderful. California is right now in the process of passing a similar law. And it's not a binding law requiring it. It's, it's a suggestion that vegetarian food be made available. That's a great example of, of what we can be pushing for now, and it's that very positive thing started here in Hawaii, and hopefully it'll spread across the country. When did things like gestation features come into existence, and who manufactures them? Yeah, they, they came into existence again right around the 1960s, and there are manufacturing companies that have been created just to do this, and also to build the factory farm building and the manure disposal system and the concrete, you know, lagoons. I think the best thing to do is to, you know, buy vegan food, number one. But if somebody really says they must eat meat, I encourage them to visit the facilities where those animals are raised. That's really the only way to know how those animals are raised. With a growing consumer interest and concern about these issues, some marketers are now putting labels on packages saying free range or humanely raised that really don't mean very much. So that's something to be wary of. 
So in terms of boycotting, the best advice is really just not to buy any animal products. And if a person is going to buy animal products, to investigate where they came from. I know that's a lot of work, but unfortunately that's the only way to really know now how, how these animals are raised. It seems to me like the struggle that you're engaged in is kind of the struggle for liberation that America is all about, you know, with women's rights, civil rights. Is there any thought of like, at the national level, like a constitutional amendment? For animal rights? Yeah, he says that we're you know, part of a liberation movement and how with women's rights and, and other potentially aligned movements and wouldn't it be nice to do something nationally as opposed to on a state-by-state basis? I would love to do something nationally, but that's just that much more difficult at this time. And if we can enact legislation in a state, it then sets a precedent for other states. So at this time, that is what we're capable of and that is what we're seeking to achieve yeah, in the back, and then. Um, on the vote, in, well, the the Downed Animal Protection Act should be introduced in about a week or two, and Senator Akaka here from Hawaii is one of the leaders on that on that legislation. So. Thank Senator Akaka for his work on the Downed Animal Protection Act and urge him to do everything in his power to move that forward. No vote is currently scheduled, but if Senator Akaka and other members of the House and Senate hear from citizens, they will be much more likely to look favorably on that. So get involved in the political process is very important. Okay. Farm Sanctuary has two facilities, one in Watkins Glen, New York, one in Orland, California. The Watkins Glen farm is about 200 acres. The, the California one is about 300 acres. And between the two, we have over 1,000 animals that we're currently caring for. The population, though, goes up and down. With a big rescue, it'll, it'll, it'll swell. With a large adoption effort, it will it'll diminish. So the population varies. And we also encourage people to come visit Farm Sanctuary. If you're ever in New York or California, it's a great place to come see animals living as they want to live. And we have visitor programs and bed and breakfast cabins. And it's a, it's a place where vegan is normal. And there aren't too many places like that in the world. I just want to say, bravo to what you do. And please let us know more about what you do and the rest of working in the world. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, you know, it's Farm Sanctuary. Thank you. Well, well, please check out our website, which is www.farmsanctuary.org. And we also have some literature over here and a sign-up sheet for our email action alert list, which we send out regularly, you know, about legislative updates or about conferences that we're organizing or about news with regard to agribusiness and farm animal issues. So thank you for saying that. And thank you all for being here and for caring as well. I mean, this is, you know, a team effort. We're all in this together. And I feel lucky to be able to do this work full time. Sometimes it's very frustrating, you know, needless to say, but it's nice to be in a room with so many friends <laughs> and not sneaking around a farm where I'm, you know, being chased off. So, so okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. That was wonderful. And I think uh, many of us who have been in the Vegetarian Society for a long time have that same sentiment that Jean just expressed, that it's nice to be among like-minded people, among friends. I hope that those of you who are joining us for the first time will develop that feeling as well. Thank you again for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.